Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Top five ICS incident response tabletops and how to run them. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Dean Parsons, certified SANS instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Dean. All right, thank you so much, Carol. Welcome everybody. Uh, looking forward to discussing uh, the five top ICS incident response tabletops with you today. These scenarios are picked and selected specifically from events that we've seen in the sector in the last number of years and in recent weeks as well. I just got off a tabletop in the oil and gas industry last week, uh, so uh, we're going to bring a lot of that experience and lessons learned to the broadcast today as well. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dean Parsons. I'm a certified instructor and I teach ICS 515. I have held several roles over the last 20 years, uh, the last eight, nine years specifically in industrial control systems, really building teams, doing threat hunting, uh, building out incident response in the electric sector for electricity generation, transmission, distribution, but also fairly recently in the oil and gas industry as well. Uh, understanding and taking care of IT and ICS related incidents, building teams there to do incident response in uh, those types of OT environments as well. Have some background in ethical hacking and NERC SIP as well, and assessments across uh, several IT, IT and industrial control system sectors. And uh, so with that, I wanna get started because we have a lot of content to cover for today. So today's topic is really gonna be talking about tabletop exercises specifically for industrial control systems. So the game is on. The reason I wanted to kind of have this webcast is because IT does a really good job of tabletops for IT, but I don't really see that IT incident response tabletops cover adequately the considerations for industrial control environments nor the impacts as well. Because of the recent news, what we are seeing is impacts in IT can have negative repercussions for industrial control environments. Specifically, I'm speaking to the fairly recent uh, pipeline event in the United States. So with that, I want to break into the agenda, brief this very quickly and punch through the next number of slides very, very uh, rapidly, but, but accurately as well to get to the scenarios. As Carl mentioned, definitely looking forward to your questions on this topic. Hopefully we can get to them. So just please drop those in the chat and we'll get to those in the Q&A section. I'm going to briefly touch on the basics and understanding and benefits of industrial control incident response exercises. I'll touch as well on critical assets that we're seeing targeted in the industrial control system environments. These assets, I would like to say, are we have hockey cards uh, kind of set up for these assets. What I mean by that is the theme today is really about hockey and, and, uh, and playing tabletops understanding where the puck is, what you can do as a defender to kind of control that incident or that puck. So these hockey cards or ICS assets are critical. We'll talk about which ones to protect the most in the industrial control environments and make sure those are included in your tabletop scenarios. We will of course run through five of the tabletop scenarios that are most likely going to be helpful to your organization today. We'll also talk about customizing those to your environment based on your uh, your kind of scenarios as well, uh, maybe some uh, gap assessments you've done in the past, et cetera. We'll also touch briefly on a new ICS post. We're super pumped to kind of release this and also a new ICS course that we're in development right now. Now, of course, we'll pivot to the Q&A. So this is has a uh, hockey kind of uh, feel to it. So the idea behind the tabletop exercises is to be proactive. Active defense is what we teach in ICS 515, getting ahead of the adversary. And the same goes for the tabletop exercises. So it's that proactive pre-game drill and practices before the actual game, before the actual event that you have to respond to. Of course, what this is going to do is prepare you and understand if you're ready for an incident. The scenarios are going to be critical, so let's uh, kind of walk through those in a little while. But based on the scenario you select, we'll have different outcomes. So as you select a scenario, and as we walk through today, they're going to be based on threat intelligence, what we've seen adversaries do in the space prior. Um, so we're going to be documenting as well and addressing the weak points that we find through the tabletop exercise. 
in general at a very high level before we dive down deeper, we're gonna really just try to understand what your organization is, is suitable to respond to today. How will your organization and your industrial environment respond to things like um, ransomware in an IT or an OT environment? What resilience do you have against the uh, ransomware that could have impacts to safety of operations? We'll talk as well about the, uh, the APTs that we're seeing that are out there using modern attack methodologies. So this goes well beyond just the script kitties that are out there. We're talking targeted attacks in industrial environments and how well does your incident response tabletops and your plans hold up to that. We will brief, as I mentioned, the uh, top I'll say critical uh, ICS assets, how they're gonna be monitored and if they're gonna be monitored and safely protected, the environment is really gonna have an impact on your ability to respond to that type of event that we'll talk about. We'll also talk as well about the industrial process. Can you operate your ICS in manual mode? Now, recent events, we've seen that they can, in some situations, be operated in manual mode, but in some other cases, um, you know, you have to rely on external, I'll say, um, organizations or maybe even vendors or maybe even a network such as the IT network. It depends on a lot of different things, but we'll get into that shortly. As we go through, we'll talk a little bit about planning and how to run the actual incident response tabletop. These are some of the top things you want to consider. We'll come back to some of these, but I will brief these first. As you go through and you plan out which tabletop scenario you will select and, and kind of deploy in your environment, you're going to really want to understand what teams you want involved in there. Obviously, we're talking about industrial control, so safety is absolutely going to be a factor. So your safety teams on site will need to be involved or highly recommended to be involved. Your emergency response could also be triggered. So that team for emergency response from a physical perspective should be sitting at the table as well. Other considerations is really going to be around who is responsible for the scenario, the actual incident. When you do incident response in ICS, the security team is obviously going to be front and, and foremost at the table. However, IT needs to be sitting there as well, engineering, operating staff, et cetera. Another thing I want to point out is the defensible cyber position to the bottom right here. Do you have a position where you can uh, disconnect or island yourself or island the ICS off for certain segments to reduce the impact if there's a contaminant in certain segments of the environment? So that cyber defensible position will come up later as well. Now there's obvious benefits with incident response tabletops for IT as well as industrial control systems. What I have found is that the awareness is a huge, huge component. So the awareness of the actual adversary capabilities that we're seeing today, but also the relationship building. So having those discussions of here's what we're seeing based on threat intelligence, this is what the adversaries can do. And having these educational conversations across different teams in the industrial control environment really brings together and builds relationships. And that's important for a number of reasons, obviously for business purposes, but it's extremely important to have tight, strong relationships, trustworthy relationships for those in facilities. Because during incidents, you will be relying on some of those people to be hands and feet in situations where you have to maintain safety and reliability. So awareness is absolutely one. The other one is obviously validating your incident response readiness. So this is training new members of your team of your incident response plan. It is also looking at the actual technical gaps that you may have in technology or processes. And also for your folks on the team who may be new to industrial control environments, having a good understanding for them of what the process is. We'll come back to baselining later, but throughout all of these scenarios that we're gonna talk about today in ICS, they're really, really focused on understanding what the operations looks like, what it actually is meant to do, what's normal for the operations, and then spotting anomalous activity. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I want to really focus us on tabletops. These are a number of different types of exercises you can do for incident response. We're going to focus on tabletop for a number of reasons, but I'll just briefly, quickly. A tabletop, which is what we're gonna focus on, is a paper-based exercise. So this does not necessarily have to rely on using technology or doing injects and things of this nature. I wanna focus on this because it's something that you could all take away after this webcast immediately and start planning between one and 30 days. You could exercise a tabletop within one to two days or take longer if you need to. So that's what I really wanna focus on. The big bang for the buck is tabletop. If you are a mature organization, have established technology processes in place for ICS, including safety, 
you can jump up to things like a hybrid or a live type of exercise. This is where you get more involved with the technology you have deployed, using it for simulation activity, using it actually for things like uh, scans and probes to follow along or drive the actual tabletop or sorry, the exercise as you go along through. And of course, as you go down from tabletop right down to ranges, more time is required typically to set up, to plan, to execute, but also more resources and things of that nature as well. So in summary for this slide, if you're new to industrial control environments or if you've just established an ICS program, a tabletop is a really good bang for your buck. So with that, as we focus on tabletops for the rest of this webcast, we're gonna focus on the planning stages, the teams, scenarios, runtime, and obviously closing the gaps. So so much of lessons learned and instant response. But of course, we're ahead of the game here. We can make those changes proactively before the adversary is seen in our environment. Planning, I've typically done these scenarios over the last number of years. Planning, I've seen between one and 30 days. This is entirely dependent on the teams you involve and obviously the scenario that you select as well and the maturity of the organization and how IT and or ICS kind of integrate or converge or not. So a lot of questions come into play about planning, but in general, one to 30 days is a really good time frame for planning. Understanding the goals, of course, of the planning cycle for instant response, tabletops is gonna be key. Is your objective, for example, to test a new technology you've just deployed? Is your goal to test all of the technologies you've deployed? Is your goal to test a new team you have in place or a new MSSP that you have in place to augment your current staff or industrial control environments? All of these things comes out in the planning stage, which leads us to things like identifying the players. The teams, again, I go back to safety here. We're talking about physical changes in the physical world. Safety needs to be part of incident response in general for industrial control systems. So they absolutely should be involved in tabletops and ranges and live simulations as well. Compliance will be a driver for incident response tabletops or uh, updates to incident response plan. So it makes sense for compliance to also be sitting at the table. So don't worry if you take anything away from today and you execute one of these scenarios, at least at a tabletop, you'll probably meet compliance in a number of your ICS compliance strategies. Engineering's operators as well as facility owners and management should be sitting at the table as well, but it's entirely up to you to include the teams that you should, uh, you should include, depending on the size of your organization. The scenario, totally in uh, it highlighted here because it is critical to focus on how and what type of scenario you're gonna execute. So obviously known gaps, anything from a uh, gap assessment you've done prior, prior engagement with an external entity or even internal, internal audit, those can drive your scenario. And that's fine, that makes a lot of sense. Um, also, taking a threat-centric approach, like for example, if you see threat intelligence indicating, well, an adversary is pivoting for, you know, from the data historian to the HMI, like that is another scenario you could use based on the threat being seen using that tactics, techniques, and procedures. So you can use different types of uh, drivers for your scenario. So all of this will be considered in the next five we'll run through. So when we're talking about planning from one to 30 days, I really see a time frame of a runtime between one to two days. I've seen it go a little longer on a tabletop, but really this is this tabletop is sitting around a table, understanding the technology, understanding the engineering side of the industrial control environments, and then having discussions at the table. So we're not talking about running PowerShell scripts to grab information. We're not talking about checking hashes in uh, the configuration or configuration files for PLCs at this point it's really sitting around the table, but it's talking about the processes of, can you check hashes on a PLC from a baseline to what's potentially in, pro in production, those things will come up as you go through your actual tabletop. And of course, closing out with the closing the gaps, assigning specific tasks, specific timeframes around a trackable event or action is gonna be critical here. A lot of times I've run these in industrial control environments and fairly recently in oil and gas, it's set up almost as a mini project is tracked through a ticketing system, people have timelines, and of course, the smart objectives come into play as well to make sure everybody is online, doing things that are realistic and time-based, et cetera. So I wanna point out as well, this is tabletops. The hybrid and the full are absolutely gonna be more planning and more time to run. I have seen a hybrid kind of scenario run, and, and the planning stage for that can be you know two plus months, and the time frame to run it is two to five days. 
So a good example of that that's available to you today is the GridX, which runs every two years. So if you're in the electric sector, GridX will actually run every two years and provide you an opportunity to run a tabletop scenario and actually be involved in not only observing, but participating in that, and that can help compliance. That type of scenario with GridX takes more time to run and is a good example of a, a longer runtime. They typically run between one to two days. So and since we have the general idea of how to run it, the planning, the teams, scenario, which is critical, the runtime, and of course, closing gaps with assigned and trackable events, we're gonna to move to really doing the actual exercise. So all this is up front, and then we're gonna to get to the scenarios in a moment. So it's game on, right? You have a scenario in place, you have the team in place, and the idea is to get around that table and start discussing this scenario. The idea as well is to make sure you have teams outside of just the security. Again, I mentioned safety, law enforcement to some degree as well may be impacted or could be relied upon. So that needs to be considered. And it's really about sharing the actual scenario with everybody around the table, all of the teams, breaking the scenario down and the actual event or attack down and discussing that, going around the table, capturing the outcomes based on your technology, your processes, and of course, recording and assigning actions as you go through. So before we jump into the actual scenarios, bear with me, there's additional hockey cards I wanna present here. These hockey cards here have a back to them. So the front right here is all of the ICS targeted assets that we see most common. On the back of each one of these hockey cards are the stats or the information that I, you guys should take away from this webcast indicating here's what you're gonna look for in this kind of scenario. Here's what you're gonna look for with this kind of asset being attacked. So we have, of course, the field devices and you have the data historian an engineering workstation and you have your HMI. These are critical assets that are being targeted today. So the idea is to collect or protect these devices at all costs and work these into your scenarios as you come up with them on your own or use these scenarios that we're gonna talk about, which they all include these critical assets that were being targeted today. If you haven't seen these types of terms before or these types of assets before, I'll briefly just uh, look over them just quickly. PLCs or RTUs or intelligent electronic devices, these are field devices, programmable logic controllers being a PLC, for example, and they actually run and control plant floors. They run the logic that says, oh, I need to inject additional chemical into this vat to produce uh, glue, for example, or to produce a vaccine, et cetera. All these types of the logic is controlled via these types of endpoints, these field devices, and they're absolutely targeted. If an adversary can get a hold of that device or alter it, preferably from the adversary's perspective, without us knowing, then they directly impact the process at a very, very deep level. The human machine interface, top right, this is the HMI, a visual interface between the physical process that the operators use on a regular basis to review the process to understand well, what kind of vaccine am I creating? What's the batch uh, doing? Do I have fuel pumping through, uh, refined fuel pumping through my pipeline? At what rate do I have it? Where is it going? All of that is controlled or at least viewable from the human machine interface. This is targeted because if an adversary can get to the HMI, they do not need malware to disrupt, stop, or damage the process in any way. So critical, critical asset. The engineering workstation, bottom right, this is the EW, access to software that reprograms, adjusts, modifies field devices up on the top left. It changes configuration, setting, et cetera, et cetera. So if the logic that's stored on the engineering workstation is adjusted and then shifted into and uploaded into the PLC, then we have a situation where, again, the PLC, the plant floor, if you will, is controlled by the adversary. So engineering workstations, absolutely a critical device that needs to be protected at all costs. So you wanna make sure you collect that hockey card. The data historian as well is a database store essentially, and it's commonly abused. It holds a lot of information about the process. Now there's a common misconception that, okay, well, it's just a database, but the adversary can actually just access the data historian and learn a lot about your process. So for example, if you are creating something uh, some kind of chemical, then the ingredients uh, for that chemical can be stored partially in the data historian. The data historian in this case can store things like, well, I put this percentage of chemical into the, the mix today, or I adjusted the chemicals to here and here and here. Here's the ratios I used. 
So that information alone is, is information that the adversary can use for what we call a stage two informational, sorry, a, a, a stage two impactful event inside the control environment. Data historian, as I mentioned, is also commonly used as a pivot point. I have seen the data historian have credentials tied to an IT active directory structure, whereby if that is compromised and an adversary gets access to the HM, uh, the data historian, there could be it could be used as a pivot point to try to get inside the industrial control environment. So with that said, these four main critical targeted uh, devices we have in industrial control environments, we're going to pivot to game on. This is the actual scenarios we've been waiting for. These are the top five. And yes, I do have a bonus number six as well, which we'll get to. The top five are, and we'll walk through these. Uh, the first one is going to be on ransomware on the ICS or on IT or OT. Also, we're going to talk about the HMI being completely taken over or hijacked. We'll talk about ICS protocol abuse as well, and also the trust relationship between IT and ICS being abused. That's that data historian being abused by the adversary. And of course, we cannot have a scenario and not talk about uh, physical access and what that means from a cyber perspective in industrial control environments as well. And what I mean there is we'll go through about uh, and talk about substations and, and, and remote valve stations and things of this nature that are critical types of sites that are remote in a lot of cases in our environments. And those are uh, potentially vulnerable and absolutely targeted. All right, so the first ICS tabletop hockey card is the ransomware on ICS or on IT. We'll talk a little bit about how that can impact the environment and what we can do about it. So I'll read the scenario through, and this is exactly what we should be doing when we actually look and, and create this tabletop scenario. So we're all together around a table, uh, and here's the actual scenario. So an ICS operator workstation in a control center, and this could be at a manufacturing plant or a uh, electric utility, those control center systems, those workstations have been infected with ransomware and are not able to be utilized at this point, completely inoperable. Similar scenario is IT business network is also inoperable, but it relates to the ICS because the critical ICS industrial process billing or the ICS industrial control shipping logistics applications are also potentially inoperable. So this is very similar to the case where we've seen uh, where the colonial attack happened, where ransomware in indicated that threat intelligence indicated ransomware was on the IT network, and out of abundance of caution and a bunch of other things, including safety, the, I the ICS environment was shut off from the IT environment. So the negative impact there is that logistic programs that are relied on by the ICS environment are not accessible on IT. So if you look at this from an, an, an incident response perspective, We'll take a look at the back of this hockey card and understand, well, from a discussions perspective, teams, protection, detection, and response perspective, this is how we can run the scenario. In a discussion scenario, we can really understand, well, in our environment, in your environment, does your ICS rely on IT for things like industrial billing, for example, for shipping logistics? Is it possible that you can island off the ICS away from IT if IT is impacted and still maintain safety and the process. So for example, in the case of a pipeline, if you cannot uh, move your move your product, for example, and you have no place to store it, well then how do you, how do you, you what do you do at that point? If you can't store it and you can't push it out, can you still bill for it, for example, if the building system is available? These are the kinds of discussion points with this type of scenario. The teams involved, of course, IT will be involved specifically if it's on the business network or if the business network and IT is impacted in any way, IT security, ICS specific security folks as well, engineering operators, and of course, safety. The impacts here could be shutting down or segmenting off the ICS. So there are safety ramifications, so they obviously need to be involved as well. From a protection perspective, of course, there's no email systems inside of the ICS, but from a dis from a protection perspective on an IT environment here, email security and filtering could be utilized as that, you know, to protect from that main vector that we're seeing on a regular basis. Whitelisting on ICS specific endpoints is also helpful and possible to be utilized, but also segmentation is really, really big here. If you can island off, for example, and segment off from the IT environment using the Purdue model, using hardware such as firewalls, et cetera, and segment that off properly, you can reduce the potential contamination or spread or crawl 
of something contaminated in IT getting in towards the ICS environment. So things like the Purdue network architecture is critical for that type of protection in this scenario. Beyond that though, detecting ransomware on IT or on ICS, it comes down to lateral movement because it has to get to an endpoint, but also endpoint protection as well. So the question then is in your tabletop, do you have network security monitoring to detect things like lateral movement? Do you have endpoint protection? The traditional heuristics base, for example, on IT and or the whitelisting type on the industrial control environment. The response here in this scenario could be, can you run in manual mode from embedded HMIs on the plant floor? If you can continue to run the ICS without building logistics and having that technical digital application available, then you can potentially run from the plant floor, even if the operator workstation is unavailable. So an example of this, again, is the pipeline event in 2021. And just as a reminder, any questions you guys have, please drop them into the chat window and we'll get to those shortly. We're gonna move on to the second ICS hockey card tabletop. This is the HMI activity, otherwise known as a SCADA hijack. We have absolutely seen this in the past. We're likely gonna see it in the future. We've seen it in the 2015 Ukraine attack. We've seen it in 2020, just a number of months ago with the water utility being compromised as a result of remote access into an environment directly to the human machine interface. So let's walk through the scenario. We'll turn the card over and take a look at the stats of this hockey card as well, and what we can do about it if we have an incident response situation here. So the scenario here is operators notice a mouse moving and clicking different control buttons. That's critical, control buttons on the human machine interface. This is obviously not consistent and not normal with operations as typically seen. Typically, you're not clicking on a lot of device buttons to uh, shut down a system or turn the lights off or change the chemical uh, amount or ratio in a water facility, for example, which is what we've seen with the Oldsmar event uh, just a number of months ago. So this SCADA hijack scenario is definitely probable if we have seen it in the past as well. And it kind of goes back to who has access to the HMI, is the remote access available, all of those kinds of things. So let's flip this hockey card over, take a look at the back. The discussion points here for your team are access to the HMI for control or monitoring process. Some HMIs do not have the ability to change the process and some do. So having that discussion point about which are the critical HMIs in your ICS and how, what access is controlled around them is gonna be critical. Specifically, if you have Active Directory in IT and in ICS, they should absolutely be separate instances with no trust or no trust force or connectivity between them. In fact, users should be encouraged to have different usernames and or different passwords, of course, between them as well. And again, not trusted. So beyond that, it's who has access, but it, how can an adversary or our own teams get access? So remote access is absolutely needed. In a lot of cases, we rely on vendors to do remote access and troubleshooting, but do, do we do it or do you guys do it in a way that it's secure? Multi-factor authentication, use of a jump box in an ICS DMZ in Purdue level three, for example, following the Purdue model um, and, and a secure version of that. Typically what we do see now is obviously the Purdue model architecture deployed we see that jump box and that jump box has heavy modifications to it. So it has the, a lot of software has the ability to do logging of course, it has the ability to do screenshot captures, recording access, all of those things on screen to understand exactly who, what, where, when, and how an individual or team or an instance is accessing that jump box and where the jump box connection is pivoting to inside the ICS. So all of these will come about with regards to the teams here, obviously engineering and network architects need to be involved in this tabletop scenario. And of course the ICS security folks. We can add IT here depending on the type of remote access that's required because IT may be responsible for providing that service as well. Uh, with regards to a response in this type of scenario, a typical response can be disabling remote access. This is of course completely dependent on how you run your environment. If there's nobody at the site and disabling road access is something that you want to do. That means that you don't have access, you have to roll trucks to site. So disabling remote access is possible for response, potentially running the ICS from the plant floor. Now, what do we mean by continuously saying running the process from the plant floor? So in the electric sector, in many sectors, manufacturing, oil and gas as well, there is an HMI built into the plant floor using an embedded type of operating system that runs 
and interface using touchscreen depending on the model and you can control the process or at least monitor the process from the plant floor. That means that a window system way back up upstairs, for example, or farther away in a control center is, is, is unavailable. You can still have that ability to control the system. All right, looking for more questions in the uh, chat uh, window there. We'll address those in a little while. Number three, hockey card is the uh, scenario whereby we have a targeted ICS specific attack in the environment. So this is where we talked about APTs abusing and using the system. This is somewhat living off the land, you call it as well. This is abuse of industrial control native protocols in the environment. So again, living off the land here, we have seen this as early as 2014. We've also seen it with crash override fairly recently as well, the last couple of years. And it's likely we're gonna see more of this as we go along. Why? Because living off the land is something that the adversary can do without bringing additional malware. And of course, they can actually hide a lot better in this scenario. But don't worry, fear not, we will talk about how to detect this and protect against this as well. So the scenario for this uh, specific living off the land is the engineering team are troubleshooting network issues. So doing non-security related function, they're looking at the network and they observe unusual ICS protocol traffic. So it's normal to see ICS protocols on the network patterns that are usually normal, fairly static. But in this particular case, we do see uh, an insert your favorite ICS protocol that you use in your environment. Here, they see unusual ICS protocol for OPC, also IEC 104, for example, that was abused in the crash override, DMP3, for example, if you're in the electric sector, and also in the electric sector, ICCP. Modbus TCP as well is extremely common in many, many sectors uh, in the ICS world. So they see these protocols being abused. So they do have them in their environment, but there's an unusual amount of scanning and polling happening inside the environment. Specifically, the rates to and from the OPC server and the SCADA servers and the outstations are extremely high and abnormal. So again, we've seen this with Havix as an example, where the, uh, the malware that was used for Havix actually used uh, OPC to read things even at a tag level inside the environment. And of course, crash override, we've seen the abuse of crash, uh, sorry, the abuse of 104 protocol to actually disable and, and shut breakers off, open breakers and, and disable power uh, in the Ukraine as well. Um, I do have in brackets here possible DMP3 because there's a lot of similarities between DMP3 and 104, and there was additional modules inside of crash override. We'll leave that for another talk. But in general, these protocols can absolutely be abused, and we are, and we have seen that. So in this discussion, what points can we talk about? Well, what type of industrial control protocols do you have? Do you have a list of protocols you rely on? And if you see something outside of that norm, then you can actually trigger on a potential anomalous activity. But beyond that, if an adversary is abusing what you have in your network, a great way to understand what these patterns are and what's malicious and what's not is obviously having a baseline of the traffic. Without having an understanding of the protocols, it's gonna be difficult to do this. So you really need to deploy something like the network security monitoring model. So understanding what protocols are on the network, looking at the anomalous activity, and that needle in the haystack on a regular basis. To do this, the individuals behind network security monitoring should have engineering knowledge. So your security team should understand the protocols and what's normal for the process. The teams involved in this scenario is obviously gonna be engineering security, and safety should also be involved. Why? Because if an adversary is abusing native protocols in the environment, they could potentially have a direct impact to the environment. Similar to what we talked about with regards to uh, the PLC updates, for example, these protocol abuse can actually have direct impacts, can potentially look upon uh, and change safety instrumented systems as well, which we'll talk to. Uh, the detection of this, again, is going back to that trained defender, understanding what ICS is, what's normally in the environment using a technology and a process, like just looking at the packets or having a way to understand what the packets um, are and what's normal from the NSM process. Uh, the response in this particular case, uh, you have an IS, uh, IS, um, sorry, ICS instant response plan that can be used. Check integrity of field devices and operations. If there's a loss of control, that could potentially mean an emergency situation as well. So you do have some options in this case, but ultimately the idea is to detect this early on absolutely would be the better situation. But fear not, again, if you're looking at the network perspective, the adversary has to get into the environment. 
So before getting into the environment, some way to, uh, to detect this would be on an endpoint, for example, or some kind of interrogation of transient devices that may come into the plant as well. So there are options be, uh, before doing network security monitoring. Suffice it to say, this is a very advanced type of uh, adversary attack, and it's something that will not be happening typically overnight. Typically, we've seen the adversary live inside of an environment uh, for weeks to months prior to engaging in this type of activity. So as a defender, we do have the upper hand here and we can get ahead of it. All right, so with regards to the second last tabletop, we're gonna talk about a, uh, a tabletop scenario where we have IT pivoting into the ICS environment. So a trusted uh, connection being abused. And specifically, we're talking about the data historian here a critical asset that's gonna be used for storing information about the process that we have seen in the past being used to pivot uh, the adversary from potentially learning about the ICS or pivot directly into the ICS environment. So the scenario is this, a compromised IT active directory credential was used to access the data historian. So the adversary is on IT and then pivoting and logging into the data historian. So keep it in the back of your mind here, network architecture is gonna be critical here. With regards to uh, an additional pivot, the individual, uh, the threat actors try to pivot into the industrial control environment. So this is again a common pivot point that we have seen the adversary um, pivot from. But I do want to call out something here very specifically. It, the adversary does not necessarily have to pivot from the historian into the ICS. We have seen the adversary live inside of IT, learn about what the industrial control system environment has. So for example, if you have engineering and ladder logic files on the IT environment, then in stage one impact, we'll call it, the adversary can learn about that ICS environment from IT, and instead of digitally pivoting from the HMI or data historian, they can come back through another vector after learning about the ICS into the ICS, so such so, so as a transient device, et cetera. Suffice it to say, this scenario is directly talking about a digital pivot from the historian connected to IT, and also industrial control environments as well. In this case, the discussion really comes around, again, segmentation of the network, access control to and from the historian, multi-factor authentication potentially, and again, this is a common theme, a separate no trust ICS Active Directory from the IT Active Directory infrastructure as well. The reason we bring that up is because it is a common practice that the adversary pivots this way, and the reason they're successful in many ways is that there's a firewall rule allowing them to come inbound to the ICS using credentials uh, stolen from the IT environment. So a best practice, again, is having the separate ADs, and that could be a really good discussion point there. The teams involved in this scenario, of course, would be IT, network architects, engineering, of course, as well, ICS security teams, et cetera. Again, the detection is understanding what you have at enforcement boundaries to do network segmentation, access control, and of course, monitoring, the usual stuff. So again, the usual stuff means this is absolutely detectable as you go through. Protections, again, that's separated uh, ADs we talked about. In response to this type of scenario, though, we could limit the connectivity to the data historian. So the scenario is there's a pivot into the ICS, so cutting off that access potentially looking for exfiltration as well with regards to instant response from the data historian, any C2s, outbound connections to the internet from your environment, IT for example, or ICS can be helpful. We have seen this before where the adversary gets on the system in IT and or an ICS and it's common to get some kind of outbound connection to exfiltrate information out. That information we're talking about, the ones we're mostly concerned about is information that could lead to an impactful stage to event an event that could actually cause disruption or destruction to the industrial environment. So the response could be looking for that type of connection or looking for other types of anomalous activity or processes running on the historian. Either way, the historian is absolutely a hotspot. It's targeted and it is a way in from IT into the ICS in many environments. All right, so we'll pivot to the second last card because there is a bonus card coming up. This one here is physical access into a cyber attack. And so I've actually seen this several times in my career working in the electric sector. Uh, so we'll jump right into it. The scenario here is really a security access. So physical security team notices a hole cut in a physical boundary or fence around a specific facility. So this could be any industrial control environment. So whatever you're working in, picture this as your fence being breached physically. The physical security team investigates and they note that the physical access is a two-part attack. So we see the physical access 
that was gained to the facility, potentially breaking it through the fence, busting down a door or window, et cetera, and then contaminating this digital network with some kind of digital contaminant via a USB and or a direct plug into a, uh, an environment using a laptop, et cetera. Traditionally here though, what I have seen in the last number of years, and even as recent as two weeks ago here in, in Newfoundland where I am, a physical break-in that we've seen, um, I'll say adversaries really focused on monetary gain and monetary value. Copper theft is very common in the electric sector and we're still seeing that years, year over year. My point is here, a couple things in this scenario kind of draws through to us. One, a physical break-in is absolutely possible and it could lead to a cyber attack, but other things to consider as well are things like safety of personnel on site when there's a physical break-in. And yes, I have to say that there could be ramifications of adversaries actually physically being in there and then getting harmed as well. So in situations whereby someone's breaking into a switchyard in the electric sector, there's a whole lot of bad that can happen to the individual if they're not really paying attention to where they're walking and going around. So there's a lot of ramifications there as well, which we'll talk to you at some other point. So with regards to the scenario for this discussion, if you have a physical potential scenario, it's understand in your remote sites that you have, what kind of criticality do they play on the industrial control environment? If you were in oil and gas and you have valve stations along a pipeline and those are disrupted, for example, how can you continue your process? If you have substations in the electric sector, storage facilities that are not um, um, being guarded on a regular basis, if there's a break in there, what ramifications does that have on safety? And in addition to that, do you have things like an ability to understand and do network access control at these sites if someone was to try to contaminate the digital network at the site as well? The teams involved, physical security teams absolutely need to be involved here. Safety, of course, engineering, cybersecurity folks as well from the ICS realm. Protections here for remote physical sites. I've actually seen this happen fairly regularly. Uh, unfortunately, I've seen it as a reaction to something. So the idea with this is to get ahead of this and have remote sites that you deem critical in your environments be guarded uh, and stationed, people stationed at sites. I've seen this in a rotation where uh, guards would actually uh, drive by, for example, physically check on occasion on a rotation. I've also seen physical guards planted at sites as well. Uh, after hours. So when the teams at sites at a substation, for example, are gone home, there's still someone checking that environment out. Detection capabilities are going to be that physical door alarm. So when something is bust open, like a window or door, then the, you have the ability to get that detection. Routine checking security guards, as I mentioned as well, and also surveillance cameras is going to be huge here. So uh, we absolutely have the ability to do protection and detection. In addition to that, network access control is gonna be key here as well. Having an ability to say, well, if someone plugs in, I'm gonna challenge that device that's looking for an IP address, or I'm not gonna allow, um, or I'm gonna control USBs that may be connected if someone does a break in. So these are technical controls that can be put in place. Suffice it to say, I'm hoping this will, will have a lot of weight in the, the scenarios that you may select for your environment, especially if you have remote sites in your environment that you rely on. All right, so with that, um, we're just about done the game. We, we know that uh, we probably love hockey or hate hockey, but either way, uh, we're just about to finish the game and we get a slap shot that comes at us out of nowhere. And this slap shot is number six scenario. And this is critical as well. I had to put this in here. I did not want to, but I, I'm trying to push it in as long, all the content as I can. This scenario is a transient device scenario whereby a device is into your environment and it bypasses a number of security and it causes a potential cyber event. So the scenario is this, a contaminated transient device, USB or laptop is brought into a facility. This obviously bypasses all of your physical security and your cyber technologies and plugs directly into, in this case, a safety instrumented system, a SIS, uh, and it also plugs into the uh, specifically the PLC. So this is on the plant floor. This is at the lower levels of the Purdue. This is in the engineering levels at level zero, potentially in sensor level, and also at level one. Uh, so for routine maintenance, such as firmware patching and updates. This scenario is actually extremely practical, and I see this, and I've lived through this scenario as well. And so I've seen this where we in industrial control environments rely on vendors significantly in some cases, and that's great. But when they come in, those laptops that they bring in under their arm, that we allow them to come in, as mentioned here, 
bypass physical security controls. I mean, it has nothing to do with our firewalls, bypasses all these layers of defense, et cetera, network security monitoring, and plugs directly into the device. How do we go about understanding protections and detections around this? So let's break it down. If we look at it from a discussion perspective, network devices uh, at sites, network security devices at sites may not be the end all be all. What we can do though, is actually do things like kiosks, network access control in some cases, but things like kiosks is interrogating laptops and devices and USBs before they're actually allowed to get onto a site, before they're actually allowed to get plugged in. That is one method. What I have seen work more effectively, which does require probably more funding and more uh, rigorous management is on site you have a laptop or I'll say a engineering workstation machine that you manage. It's isolated, it's fully patched, it doesn't touch an IT network, it never leaves the plant, et cetera. And it has all the software tools required for your engineers and for your vendors. So when they come on site, they're not, we're not worried about a laptop that may have come from a hotel network somewhere the night before as they're traveling to your plant. So this transient device is still a high risk in a lot of industrial control environments. And I absolutely wanted to bring that up today. So just to kind of put that out there. So if we look back at what we've talked about, in general, we have six scenarios that we should really consider. Um, and, and, and really it's that ransomware on IT or on ICS, the human machine interface hijack. So someone as getting, an adversary is getting directly on the control environment, manipulating the process as, uh, as we would, uh, as operators, for example, manipulating the process in, in a positive way, they would abuse that. Uh, we're also seeing a more targeted attack and a more sophisticated attack. But we have seen it abusing protocols on your network. So the question is around, do you have network access control? Sorry, not network access control. Do you have network security monitoring in place to check and understand the baseline and, and anomalous activity on the network using those native protocols? And of course, the trusted pivot point from the historian or some other type of device into the industrial control environment. Again, what's critical there is using the Purdue model and the physical access, when there is a physical breach, at the very least, the, the physical security team should reach out and have some kind of conversation with the, um, the cyber security folks to make sure they're involved to check things and do integrity checks. My most recent tabletop uh, for um, oil and gas was also in the NERC SIP area. A lot of oil and gas environments, um, if, if you're refining, you actually can generate electricity as well through the refining process. So NERC SIP was part of that, and I was involved in the process for uh, the tabletop for that. In that case, there was a physical breach, and we did have the, hey, let's bring in the cybersecurity folks as well. Even though it looks like someone may just rip the fence down, what else could be potentially impacted inside the facility? So we did have that scenario as well to kind of run through. And of course, the transient device at the end. So these six top, I'll say hockey card tabletop exercises uh, if you take this as a collection and move forward with selecting from here, if you have no other scenarios in your environment, these will give you a lot of benefit and are all directly related to events that we've seen in the last number of years and also in recent weeks as well. So to summarize, um, over the last number of years, me conducting these types of incident response tabletops, a collection from the electric sector or the oil and gas sector, all of this has been refined down to say that safety is absolutely needs to be sitting at that table. Uh, table taps actually lead to threat hunting as well. So while we're bringing up scenarios here at a high level, when you talk about threat hunting with mature team, we're actually talking about a hypothesis. So I actually a lot of times see um, some of my clients and in organizations really pivot from tabletops to actual threat hunting at a very deep technical level as well. Um, the reliance on IT is a question that I have seen come up in the last number of years and most recently with the Colonial event, of course, more than security teams. So again, building those relationships with other teams because at some point doing ICS incident response, you will have to rely on engineering folks in the plants that may not have a lot of experience in security, but you will rely on those to do things like data acquisition, et cetera, and other kind of components of ICS uh, in incident response use sector events. So if you if you do not wish to use these top six, use other events you may seen specifically in your sector and run that as a tabletop for your specific environment. Uh, tabletop annually. Uh, so absolutely annually is, is, is the frame the time frame. I would suggest running a tabletop. Again, focusing on the tabletop is really that 
uh, you know, heavy hitter, it's, it's low hanging fruit versus a live event is a little bit more involved, a lot more planning there, you'll get more from it, but a tabletop is fairly easy to execute. And of course, the actions and repeat on applying the actions that you kind of deem from the, uh, from the scenario. So definitely not all doom and gloom here. Worry not, we do have a way forward here. ICS defense is absolutely doable. And uh, there's a lot of ways we can kind of uh, go through that based on the scenarios we kind of talked about and the, uh, I'll say the detection response capabilities. So with regards to ICS defense, we all have a role to play here and it's vital to make sure that our critical infrastructure is protected. Uh, I don't want to say, you know, fear and uncertainty, doubt stuff that the adversaries get more sophisticated. We're all aware of that. And it's really all about getting access to what's normal in our environment, running these scenarios, learning from it, and uh, and having a beer after the fact at the end of the day. So uh, uh, worry not. Um, with regards to a general tabletop summary, overall, if you do not have a scenario, we recommend you start with one of these top five or six to start. Pick one of those in your sector and kind of run with it from there. As you grow and mature over time, you will absolutely create your own scenario is based on your threat landscape. So if you're a cookie factory, for example, your adversaries may not be APTs. But if you're oil and gas, if you're wastewater management, then your threat landscape is different. So make sure you align with what threats you're seeing in your specific landscape, customized to your needs. Internal audits I've seen absolutely be used as, um, uh, and gap assessments as well, either internal or external, to drive compliance. And you can absolutely get a great scenarios from those kinds of gaps because it's specific to your environment. With your scenarios you create though, please focus on things like the gaps in incident response specifically to ICS. Uh, also consider safety as we know, and of course involve as many teams as you can. That builds that bridge we talked about, the handshaking and also the uh, ability to rely on other teams and trust you in incident response scenarios. You will have to rely on other teams when you do industrial incident response. So with that, there's only two more slides and we'll get into the question. I do want to introduce you to the latest industrial control system poster we've just released. This is an ICS assessment quick start poster. So this has obviously two sides to it. The first side is really quick starter on how you can start assessing your environments. So it it talks about data gathering, for example, physically walking through a plant, what you should look for, preparing for active cyber defense, looking at a network for specific kind of levels in the Purdue model. And it talks about assessing your environment from a vulnerability assessment as well. It gives you options of things like active scanning, passive scanning. So take a look at that. The flip side of this poster as well, we'll talk about ICS security maturity. So if you have a program established or you're creating a program, gravitate towards that side of the poster and just it'll run you through access control, logging, monitoring, instant response. And this is all mapped to the NIST cybersecurity framework. The whole framework is not mapped. What is mapped here is the critical areas that you're gonna wanna look for uh, when you're getting your maturity kind of assessments up and running for your ICS. So this is available at the link below there and uh, it's available now. So please take a look there. A lot of really good content there if you wanna get into assessing your environments. Also, I'm super pumped to let you guys know that uh, we're developing a ICS course, a new ICS SANS course. This is ICS 418. So this is ICS Security Essentials for Managers. So this is a two day course. Don't let the word manager scare you though. If you're coming into a management role or have management types of tasks in your role today from the industrial control environment, then this course is for you. If you're new to the management area entirely from IT coming into ICS, this course is for you. So the information for this course and all the new courses that we have coming is at the top of the screen here. Please take a look. Super pumped to get this rolling for you guys later this year or early next year, that's the plan. So please keep a watch out for that. With that, I will conclude the content for today. Uh, I think we do have some questions for, uh, uh, for us here and we do have some time. So what I'll do is say again, thank you, game on, and uh, I'll pass it back over to Carol to see if she has any questions from, from you guys today. All right, thanks so much. We do have quite a few questions, so I'll jump in and get started. Now the first one asks, how often do you recommend ICS IR tabletops are conducted? Yeah, great question. So I kind of hinted at it earlier. I, I do see it happen fairly regularly, <clears throat> at least uh, at least annually. However, if for example you're in the electric sector, you're you're probably driven by or using and aligning to NERC and NERC SIP requirements and, and standards, and that's great. If you do have that requirement, then 
I think it's 15 months. Every 15 months, you have to run some kind of tabletop. And that means you have to have evidence of running the tabletop, uh, logging the tabletop, and have actions required uh, and, and you know tasks to individuals. So similar to what we talked about earlier. So in short, I would recommend once every 12 months, but other compliance regimes would say things like 15 months. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, which of the five ICS tabletops would you suggest a newly established ICS security team perform first? Mm, that's a good one. Um, I would say newly established environment really should focus on things like segmentation and, and pivoting. So there's two that I recommend. Uh, one is the abuse from IT or, or trusted asset from IT into ICS. And, and the next one would be segmentation, just any, anything around segmentation and uh, using the Purdue model. So a scenario that would test your architecture for sure. Great question. All right, thanks. Uh, there seems to be a pattern of having network security monitoring set up inside control networks. Is this a common best practice in the industry today? Hmm. Yeah, so um, so network security monitoring is not specific to industrial control environments, but it excels in ICS for several reasons. And and so, is it a best practice? I would say absolutely. If 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 you do not have ICS network security monitoring deployed today, then you're you're absolutely not not in a great place. Uh, and I think that even finding adversary campaigns and attacks that are not specific to um, APTs. Having network security monitoring is absolutely going to help you detect uh, e events that will impact your industrial control environments. Another benefit for network security monitoring in ICS is it actually allows you to find troubleshooting issues as well. So it's not only great for security, it allows you to kind of try to find ICS specific troubleshooting um, elements and, and, and increase your reliability of operations. So it's, it's twofold. So to answer your question uh, directly, yes, it, it, I would say it's a best practice for sure. And even through class, we're trying to drive more and more students and environments and utilities to do network security monitoring at some level. And that does not mean uh, a million dollar budget. It can be as simple as something like Security Onion on a laptop and, and a regular packet capture and analysis with tools like Zeek and others. So yeah, it's absolutely achievable. And I would say it's a best practice 100%. Yeah, great question. All right, thanks. If you could suggest two affordable things for ICS defense for a newly established for a newly established ICS security program, which ones and why? Mm, um, I, I would so tools aside, I would absolutely suggest trained individuals. I think that's absolutely the best thing to do because a trained individual can use even freely available tools with no cost, no budget to do a lot of good solid defense. If I was to have to pick two processes or technologies, network security monitoring, no surprise, is one of them. And the next would be really having a solid process uh, and architecture, again, following Purdue, uh, the Purdue model. Yeah, great question. All right, thanks. If you could add another ICS incident response scenario to the list, which would it be? Mm, another one to make it seven. Um, Okay, so I do a lot of site assessments, so I actually physically get to sites, and, and what I do find beyond the scenarios here that we mentioned is I probably 60 or 70% of the time, I will find a rogue access point, a wireless rogue access point at site. And that's not necessarily to say that an adversary placed it there, although I absolutely have seen that as well, hidden in a rack, but I would suggest things like a security, uh, sorry, a wireless scan or wireless rogue access point survey of, of your critical sites and remote sites? It's a great question. Wow, that's seven scenarios for today, all right. All right, thanks. Well, uh, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. Um, I do want to refer anyone whose questions we haven't gotten to yet uh, to please reach out to Dean directly. He's given his contact information uh, right there on the screen. Um, you do have some feedback. Someone said they, great webcast, they like the hockey card layout. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'm I'm in Canada, eh? So I have to do something for Canada. So Canada's future. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dean, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care 
and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.